Welcome to chapter 15 in OpenStax Astronomy. In this video, we are going to introduce several terms that we will be seeing in this chapter, along with how they relate to one another. This whole chapter and the next one are both about our nearest star, the Sun. The Sun is part of our solar system, and it's what we need in order to be able to have life here on Earth. Now, one thing that a lot of students have trouble with is understanding just how drastically different in size the Sun and the Earth are. The Sun has a diameter of nearly 1.4 million kilometers, but our brains don't really do anything with a number that big. We just kind of file that away as that's big. But what is useful for us to think about is that it is over a hundred times wider across than the Earth is. And since volume cares about radius cubed, it has a hundred times a hundred times a hundred times the volume of Earth. Which means we could, if the Sun were just a hollow sphere, we could fit over one million Earths inside it. This is a very big object that does not look big in our sky simply because of how far away the Earth truly is from the Sun. Now one thing we can also do, and we have a couple of times before, is to come up with a small scale model that helps us think about these sizes in a way that has any meaning to us, makes any sense to us. So let's say that the Sun were the size of a quarter. Now, the farthest human-made object, if we are holding the quarter in our hands, the farthest human-made object is Voyager 1. It was launched back in the 1970s, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, and has been traveling outwards um, from Earth since then. And in our scale model here, it would just be 0.2 miles away. That's a couple of city blocks just down the road. Our solar system, which we are going to get into the details of at the end of the um, semester, in the last module, our solar system extends about 150 miles in all directions. That would be all the way from Grand Rapids out to Chicago in all directions, though. Now, when we say solar system, that means objects that are gravitationally bound to just the sun and not a different star. And so it's kind of like our little bubble in space, stuff that is part of our little, um, our little system. But every single star that we see in the night sky has its own little system. And the very closest star to us, if we are holding a little quarter in our hands right now, in the room that we're in, the very closest star to us would be Proxima Centauri. It would probably be about a nickel or a quarter that someone was holding out in St. Louis, over 400 miles away. Now, I want us to sit back and think about that. That means that in all directions, 400 miles in all directions from where you're sitting right now, holding your little quarter um, model, there are no other stars. However, our galaxy is filled with 200 billion stars. And so we coming into this class and people on the street in general really do not have a sense of scales involved in astronomy. And so we need to recognize that that's something that we have to start to build into our framework to start to understand why, although we can study the stars, we cannot hope to travel to them. They are just too far away for our technologies. Now, the other thing I need to remind us of from chapter five is that we knew that the sun makes an absorption spectrum because although the core is very hot and creates a black body uh, radiation, black body curve, nice, smooth, continuous spectrum, there's all these outer layers of the sun that are absorbing material and telling us what elements are present. We saw the picture here on the left in chapter five, um, both in the textbook and the lecture videos. What we didn't talk about was the fact that when we look at this absorption spectrum, some of those lines are wider than others. Some of them are darker than others. And it actually takes a whole lot of really complex physics to use the strength 
of those absorption lines to determine how much of each element is present. Back in chapter five, we talked about spectral fingerprints, how each element has its own pattern and we can see those patterns show up to, to know if those elements are there or not. But, and although the math is outside the scope of this course, we wanna recognize that it's possible to do, we can use the strength of the lines, how dark are those lines, how deep, how wide, to figure out how much of each of those elements are present. And the first person to do this for um, the sun or any star was Cecilia Payne Gaposchkin. Now she earned a PhD in 1925 from Harvard University, and she was the first woman to earn a PhD in astronomy in the entire United States. And what she found was that the sun is about three quarters hydrogen and one quarter helium. And at the time, everyone thought that the sun was mostly just made of the same stuff in the same quantities that the earth was. It was just hotter. And so this dissertation was a really big deal. And a lot of people at the time did not believe it or thought that she had done something wrong. And so her advisor even suggested that she tone down her conclusions a bit. Um, but it, after um, people following up over the next decade or so, we recognized that that work was in fact quite correct, that Cecilia Payne Kaposchkin had figured out that the sun is mostly hydrogen and helium. We are gonna see those three quarters hydrogen, one quarter helium numbers um, quite a bit throughout the course. What we will find out is that almost the entire universe is made of mostly just hydrogen and helium in those fractions because that's what the universe started out with. But we don't wanna to get too far ahead of ourselves. Now, the sun shines brightly because it makes light and heat. We will be talking about, mostly in chapter 16, how that process works, where that energy is coming from, because it can't just be created out of nothing. And so these inner layers of the sun, the core, the radiative zone, the convection zone, these are going to come up as terms in chapter 16. So this slide is not meant to have us fully understand the interior of the sun, just to introduce these terms to us. The core is about 20% of the interior. It's where the sun makes its energy, its light and heat. And then the radiative zone and convection zones are different ways to bring energy to the surface. And again, we're not gonna talk about them in detail in this video, but that will come up in chapter 16. The sun is so hot, it's over 10 million degrees um, Kelvin at the core, that everything inside it is not a gas, but rather a plasma. Now you may know this, the three common states of matter, gas, liquid, solid from um, middle school or high school science. Plasma is an additional state of matter that acts very similar to a gas, um, but is so hot that all of the um, electrons are stripped away from the, the nuclei of atoms. So everything is ionized. We learned that word very briefly in chapter five, we don't need to get into those details, but we do need to recognize um, that plasma is a little bit different than a gas. Now, the terms that we're going to introduce in this video and then explore more throughout this chapter are the outer layers of the sun, the photosphere, the chromosphere, and the corona, and structures that we see in those layers, sunspots, spicules, active regions, and coronal holes. So all of these terms, if you want to pause the video just to write them down, that's perfectly fine. All of these terms are going to be introduced briefly in this video and explored in more detail in upcoming videos. If we were to take a picture of the sun on a clear day with a camera, never look directly at the sun with your eyes, but if we took a picture of it, we would be collecting visible light with that camera or smartphone, and we would have a photo of the sun's photosphere. Maybe an easy way to think about it. The photosphere can be seen in visible light. And the photosphere, if we were able to zoom in really close, so maybe not a smartphone anymore, but now we need a telescope. But if we zoomed in really close, we would able, be able to see a pattern called granulation. It's shown here on the left where there's kind of a darker outline 
and brighter cells. Um, it kind of looks like a cellular structure or a honeycomb kind of pattern. And this is formed by convection. Now, convection brings hot material up, then that heat is deposited out onto the surface, and then the cold material sinks back down again. It's the same kind of physics that happens in a pot of boiling water as well, because when you are boiling a pot of water to make pasta, for example, you are only heating the bottom of the pot. So only the bottom is actually receiving direct energy, and then that hottest water at the bottom rises up, and then it deposits some steam and stuff, it, it loses some of the heat at the top, and then the colder water um, falls back down again to create this cycle motion. Now, if we think about our understanding from chapter five, hotter material shines a little bit brighter and is a little bit more yellow white than like a dull reddish or brown. So what we are seeing in this picture here is at the center of this upwards motion, it is the lighter orange yellow color because that material is hotter, so it's brighter and more yellow. And then the cellular outline type structure is the colder material that is dimmer because it is colder and it is less bright orange because it is colder as well. So at small scales, we see the granulation and at large scales, the other big thing that the photosphere is known for are sunspots. Now, sunspots are something that we will talk more about in the upcoming chapters. But the one thing I want to point out beyond that is that the sunspots are often um, roughly the size of Earth. So in the previous picture, we have the approximate size of Earth um, relative to this sunspot group highlighted in the textbook. And then this picture here um, is one that I just got from, uh, from Helio Viewer. Um, it's an open source uh, website for visualizing public solar data. This, the Earth is shown in the upper right to scale, um, and this group is also a larger sunspot group as well. The other key things we need to keep in mind for the photosphere beyond the fact that it's what we see with visible light and it's where we see sunspots is that the photosphere is kind of like the sun's surface. And we use air quotes or real quotes around surface because it is not a solid surface the way that standing on Earth's surface would be. But because it separates the inside layers, things we cannot take images of, from the outside layers, things we can take images of, we treat it like a boundary, a surface. It is also important to note that this is the part of the sun and it's the part of all stars that we refer to when we, when we give a temperature for those stars. When we say that the sun is 5,800 Kelvin, we are talking about the temperature of the photosphere. Now, when we wait around for a solar eclipse on the surface of Earth, the new moon fully covers up the bright photosphere and we're actually able to see the other layers in visible light as well, only during a solar eclipse because normally they're outshone by the photosphere. In this picture here, what we see is a kind of few spots of this pinkish reddish color. That is the chromosphere. And the rest of the visible light around is the corona. Both of these, although they can be seen in visible light during a solar eclipse, normally that is not the type of light that we investigate them with. The chromosphere we normally um, try to use near ultraviolet, so things just outside of visible light, to, to see the very hot material there. The chromosphere was named because of those solar eclipses. They do look pinkish red in, um, in pictures because of specific wavelengths that are being produced by these um, little spikes, which we now call spicules. You can see those spicules as little whiskers off the edge of the disk of the sun in this picture here. And spicules are the single most important um, structure that are able to be seen in the chromosphere. The reason why spicules are so important is because they are probably a very important part of what makes the outermost layers of the sun's atmosphere so hot. This is called the coronal heating problem. And what it is, is if we think about 
how a campfire would work. If we are really close to a campfire, it is hot. If we walk away from that campfire, it gets colder. That makes sense to us. The problem with the sun is that the heat source is the interior of the sun. As we get farther and farther away, it gets cooler and cooler like we expect. But then right after the chromosphere, which is at a temperature of about 10,000 Kelvin, there is a huge temperature spike so that the outermost layer, the corona, is over 1 million degrees Kelvin. Now this is a place where we need to remind ourselves of what temperature is really telling us. Because if we were flying our spacecraft through the corona, we wouldn't necessarily feel like everything around us is extremely, extremely hot on fire. Because the density is very, very low in the corona. So what that temperature is really telling us is the molecules in that area are moving extremely quickly. Back in chapter five, we briefly made sure we understood that temperature is a measurement of the speed of the atoms or molecules in a material. And so in the corona, this is telling us that things are able to be sped up very, very fast. The corona is extremely hot. It's over a million degrees. And when we take pictures of it, we are typically using x-rays or extremely short wavelength ultraviolet. So extreme ultraviolet to take images of the corona. So this is a picture with all three of those in one go. The photosphere is visible light, and that's where we see sunspots. The chromosphere is near ultraviolet or specific wavelengths that pick out the chromosphere. And then the corona is the highest energy forms of light, um, x-rays or extreme ultraviolet. Now the corona is where we will find active regions, which is um, highlighted for us on the right here with little AR as well as coronal holes, which are highlighted on the left of this picture here with a CH. We'll explore both of those structures in the next video. So I'm just mentioning them now, but we'll actually talk about them in a different video. I don't want this video to get too long. And it's worth making sure we recognize that most of the pictures that I've shown you in this, um, in this set of slides are from helioviewer.org which you can access and play around with um, as much as you want to. It's a really cool way to investigate different layers of the sun in different wavelengths as well. So the key outer layers that we've introduced in this video are the photosphere, the chromosphere, and the corona. And we talked about four different structures, and it's worth making sure we understand where they are able to be seen. Sunspots are seen in the photosphere, Spicules are seen in the chromosphere, and active regions and coronal holes are seen in the corona. We will describe all of those in a different video. This is just our brief overview of everything. So I will see you in that next video.